Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Adrian and Andrew are on assignment. Tonight, the pandemic ripple effect and the dangerous strain on urgent care. This is not nursing. This is, uh, you know, cutting a lot of corners. Healthcare workers in Quebec sound the alarm as burnout hits the system. And experts say it's a cross-country problem. Also tonight... The least we can do is change the name of this damn street. Toronto's famed Dundas Street will get a new name. Tangled masses of fishing gear, islands of styrofoam. That probably weighs 200 pounds, just that alone. The people trying to fix the plastic problem washing up on BC's shores. That's not supposed to be a garbage can. And... Canada has a starring role in the newest groundbreaking Pixar flick. This is who we are, this is the people we have here. This is The National. Over the last 16 months, healthcare workers have become heroes to many Canadians. Their critical work both highlighted and made so much harder by the pandemic. Now with COVID receding, a new healthcare crisis is emerging. This one with the workers themselves. It's happening across the country, but in Quebec, emergency doctors are warning. ERs there are on the brink of collapse. So overburdened and understaffed, patients are being put at risk and in some cases, not being accepted at all. The situation is being exacerbated by two major factors here. Demand is up after people avoided hospitals for months, and nurses are quitting. Sarah Levitt explains why. At Maisonneuve Rosemont Hospital in Montreal's East End, a steady stream of patients enters the emergency department. The problem is, once inside, there isn't enough staff to care for them. We're losing uh, nurses that leave because they're tired, they're exhausted, they're fed up with being uh, forced to stay for an overtime uh, shift again and again and again. The pandemic has taken its toll. In an open letter to the provincial government, Dr. Mathieu, among others, outlined the strain COVID-19 put on the healthcare system, writing about increased workload, emotional strain, deteriorating work climate. Nurses have fled the public system. Many are heading to the private sector where there's more stability, more money, and no forced overtime. So you've been an ER physician for now 35 years. Have you ever seen anything like this? Not so dangerously uh, close to, uh, to shutting down, no. I cannot provide uh, therapeutic care my care shifts into making sure everybody is alive. This ER nurse calls the current situation dire. This is not nursing. This is, uh, you know, cutting a lot of corners. It, it puts their safety at risk. It puts my license at risk. The shortage is being felt across the province. A hospital near Quebec City is now closing its ER overnight until at least September. Others are simply asking patients not to come. And at Hull Hospital, a woman with severe stomach pain spent some of her final hours on the ER floor. No stretcher or bed was available. Her family blames the staffing shortage. The issue extends beyond Quebec. The New Brunswick Nurses Union says there are 854 vacant nursing jobs in that province. And the Canadian Nurses Association says it's a nationwide problem. The realities of, of uh, the pandemic and the experiences that they've had um, are really pushing many of them towards retirement early. And uh, for some uh, newer nurses, uh, they're really re rethinking whether they want to continue in the profession, which is really a sad state of affairs. I'm more scared this time than ever before because uh, if we don't have the arms to work, if we don't have the nurses, the respiratory therapists, this is going to not work. Sarah, has the Quebec government responded to the letter from the doctors? Well, Asha, the health minister has acknowledged there is a problem. He says his office is monitoring 25 ERs across the province in a way to look, uh, to look for ways to improve services. And they're going to boost home care in an effort to kind of relieve the pressure off the ERs. Meanwhile, that nurse that I was speaking to, well, he's on shift right now here at the Lakeshore General Hospital. Its ER is running at 174% capacity. That's the highest on the island of Montreal. He says he'll continue to come to work uh, and offer the best care that he can under the circumstances. All right, thank you so much, Sarah Levitt in Montreal. 
Vaccines are helping to lower the burden of COVID cases on hospitals, but as infections drop and more places reopen, the issue of vaccine passports is taking center stage. Cameron McIntosh with where you'll need one and the concern it's causing. Bright and early, a long, brisk lineup in downtown Winnipeg. Walk up COVID shots. The three of us all want to get vaccinated. Claire Davis yeah, is signing she brought her sisters. We hope to really get starting to do things back to normal. In Manitoba, a second shot plus two weeks comes with benefits. A QR code or card, proof of vaccination. So everyone wins with this. The Premier says holders can use it to avoid travel restrictions and soon attend movies, concerts, even pro sports. These vax cards are a good initiative that can help to give people who choose to get vaccinated their lives back a little faster. So while Manitoba's card works here, there's no guarantee it'll be recognized anywhere else. There's no one national standard for proof of vaccination. But many businesses and institutions are starting to ask for that proof. Everyone from Seneca College in Ontario to this Toronto strip club. The mayor is calling for his province to create a passport. It's just a very practical matter that if somebody asks, you got to know where you can get the proof. Thing is, many provinces want nothing to do with a quagmire of privacy and human rights issues. I believe that they would, in principle, contravene the uh, Health Information Act. While Ottawa is working on a card for international travel, the Prime Minister has ruled it out domestically. The provinces themselves uh, will establish as what is right for them. This medical ethicist believes that's a mistake. The resulting hodgepodge, I think, will make us all less secure. But civil liberties groups are wary. The risk is that you're creating a two-tier society and that there's no legal authority to be making these distinctions. Back in Manitoba, Pallister calls it a short-term incentive. We hope this is not a permanent and necessary measure, obviously. There's still a lot more needles needed in arms to get there. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. In B.C., more people have been told to leave their homes as more than 300 wildfires continue to burn across the province. In the Caribou region, people on 1,500 properties were urgently evacuated today. Thousands more in the region are on high alert, officials warning them be ready to leave, including the entire town of 100 Mile House, five hours north of Vancouver. More than 70 wildfires are burning in northern Ontario. The province has issued an emergency order which would allow officials to restrict travel or access to some areas if needed. Some First Nations communities have already been evacuated like Deer Lake, Pekanjikum and Poplar Hill. Tonight we are learning much more about the men killed in that crane collapse in Kelowna, B.C. Brady Strachan is in the city speaking to friends and family. Morning lives cut too short. The twisted metal is a constant reminder of the devastating incident that killed five men Monday. One of them was 23-year-old Kalen Vilness. His father says he had just returned to the construction site after some time off. Unfortunately, that was his first, um, his first day back. Um, and he basically, he, he made a, a half of a shift and then was, was tragically killed. So. Vilness was about to settle down in Kelowna with his girlfriend. The couple had just bought a house. Coming up to help him move. Um, unfortunately, that won't happen. His family is preparing to hold memorial services for Vilness, one in Kelowna, one in Kitimat, where he grew up. 32-year-old Jared Zook, another victim. This is a really, really tremendous man. Smiling photos adorn a memorial board put up among flowers near the site. Dan Johnstone knew him growing up. He says the news is devastating. Just to think that you never had a chance to say goodbye or I love you or thanks for being a good friend. And it's just, it's tough because you never get that, you never get that opportunity again. The Stemmer family is mourning two losses, Eric and Patrick, brothers from Salmon Arm. Their family owns a construction company that was working on the site when the crane collapsed. The final victim worked in a nearby office. The crane collapsed on his building. Authorities recovered his body from the rubble overnight. 
The area behind me is still under an evacuation order as work is done to stabilize and remove the crane. The RCMP say they're still investigating what exactly caused the collapse, but we know that workers were in the process of dismantling the crane when it came down. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna, British Columbia. Members of Hamilton, Ontario's Muslim community are speaking out tonight after Hamilton police charged a man in what they're calling a hate crime. Police say a mother and daughter were walking through a parking lot Monday night when they were almost hit by a vehicle. Then they say the driver started using anti-Muslim slurs. We continue to be outraged by these blatant acts of hatred. We stand with the Muslim community here in Hamilton and across the country in condemning Islamophobia. The women have been identified as the family of an imam at a downtown mosque. Members there say they are concerned for the family's safety. The incident follows a deadly attack in London, Ontario, when a man killed four members of a Muslim family. A major decision with major impacts for the City of Toronto tonight. City Council has decisively voted to rename one of the city's main drags over concerns about the legacy of its namesake, Scottish politician Henry Dundas and his role in prolonging slavery. Here's Ellen Morrow with details and reaction. Dundas, a name ubiquitous in Toronto, soon to be no more. The item is meant to carry. Toronto City Council voting today to replace it. You can never go wrong doing the right thing. Dundas Street runs east to west across the entire downtown core and beyond, home to nearly 100,000 people, named after Henry Dundas, a British politician criticized for his role in delaying the end of the transatlantic slave trade. This historian says changing the name is long overdue. I should not have to walk down a street named for the person who was instrumental in the enslavement of nearly 600,000 people. The change will affect hundreds of street signs, Toronto's famed Young and Dundas Square, two subway stations and more than 4,000 businesses. The cost for the city estimated between 5.1 and 6.3 million dollars. The vote comes after a city report recommended changing the name, arguing that doing so would be part of the larger effort to tackle systemic racism in Toronto and make the city more inclusive. City staff consulted black and indigenous community leaders and local BIAs. Some councillors argued there should have been broader public consultation. And I'm very worried that this has become the standard at which we will judge whether we need to go and take chisels and hammers and take someone's name off of a wall. It all follows more than a year of racial reckoning, monuments to Canada's colonial past being torn down. I'm really hoping that um, it's not just something that they do and pat themselves on the back and then that's it. Shannon Oyanaran says there's so much more the city needs to do. Jobs, education, um, unemployment, housing, all these things need to be dealt with. It can't just be, again, this nice gesture. New name recommendations are expected next year, set to honour Toronto's diverse present instead of the past. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Federal party leaders continue to make appearances right across the country today, even though officially they're not in campaign mode. Travis Danraz shows us how Canada's political leaders are gearing up for an election that's yet to be called. On my first national tour as conservative leader from vancouver island that's our new democrat plan to windsor ontario to the gaspe peninsula in quebec and that province's capital leaders fanned out across the country meeting and greeting voters but the writs aren't dropped yet the pre-campaign period is a good time for leaders to go to areas that they might not be able to go during a campaign signs of an impending campaign are mounting the conservatives say their plane and buses are ready and CBC News has learned Liberal staffers have been asked to be back in Ottawa by early August. But today, we're not here to talk about the election campaign, said the Prime Minister, rushing off questions about a possible election call. The last week, he was spotted filming ads during a swing through North Vancouver. On social media, the push on as well. Jagmeet Singh with his signature TikTok videos. I'm glad you asked that, Connor. Aaron O'Toole uh, taking questions on Facebook Live. Right 
The Liberals ramping up ad buys, purchasing a swath on Facebook for the first time in months. It'll be an onslaught of, of advertising. It'll be an onslaught of content generation. This strategist says parties are using your social networks for their gain. You have more influence over your friends and family than any political party ever will. The only leader not on the road? The Green Party's Annemi Paul, whose party held a meeting last night to discuss revoking her membership. They can't afford really this kind of turmoil when they only have two seats going into this campaign. The big question right now is when. A new governor general will be installed in just over a week. But with COVID variants spreading and worries about a fall fourth wave, the prime minister has a lot to consider as he contemplates a trip here to Rideau Hall. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Ottawa. A topic that will certainly come up on the campaign trail, climate change. In Europe today, a sweeping new plan to tackle the crisis. It takes aim at everything from cars and trucks to coal-powered energy to certain foreign imports. But while the EU is clearly aiming high, the plan needs a lot of support to get off the ground. Aaron Collins walks us through it. They're calling it Fit for 55. Not a workout plan for bureaucrats, but the EU's race to reduce emissions 55% below 1990 levels in under a decade. Change on this scale is never easy, even when it's necessary. And an even more ambitious target looms on the horizon for the EU. Net zero in less than 30 years. A last minute sprint to make up for decades of foot dragging. If we get to minus 55 in 2030 and uh, climate neutrality in 2050, humanity has a fighting chance. Here at home, that urgency underscored by events scientists have linked to climate change. An early start to another devastating wildfire season in western Canada on the heels of a record-shattering heat dome. We don't have a whole lot of time to play with here. And, and governments like the EU are responding to public pressure. The 27 countries of the EU still have to green light the ambitious plan, but if they do, sales of gas and diesel cars will be banned by 2035. The cost of carbon emissions will spike and carbon-heavy imports will be met with tariffs, something Canadian exporters could avoid thanks to Canada's federal price on carbon. So we will be spared some and perhaps all depending on the level of our carbon tax relative to the internal one of the EU. U.S. President Joe Biden has his own ambitious plan to address climate change. You know, these steps will set America on a path of net zero emissions. But with no national carbon tax, U.S. exports may be caught up in the EU's carbon tariff. The EU plan sends a clear message that the bloc is serious about reducing emissions. The hope is that with the next U.N. climate conference scheduled for this fall, it's a lead the rest of the world will finally follow. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. There are two ships anchored off the coast of Newfoundland tonight, stuck at sea as crew members isolate from a COVID-19 outbreak. Three new cases have been reported aboard one ship in Conception Bay. That brings the total number on that vessel to eight, with one crew member taken to hospital. The other ship has 14 reported cases. Testing continues aboard both. The pandemic has been especially hard on shipping crews. COVID-19 restrictions means for many, once they go out to sea, it can be nearly impossible to get home. Peter Armstrong explains. This is the busiest port in Canada, the hub for our insatiable demand for goods from abroad. Everything from that fancy new coffee machine to the raw materials needed to build houses, bridges and buildings. That surge in demand combined with COVID travel restrictions has caused a humanitarian disaster at sea. You feel like your heart must be broken. Roly Page was so stuck at sea for 11 to... months. He signed on for six months as the second officer of a vessel hauling fertilizer, grains, coal and aluminum. It delivered cargo to Europe and the Americas before eventually stopping in Vancouver. When his contract was up, he wanted to get off the ship and go home to the Philippines. But in port after port, Page was told COVID restrictions made it impossible to go ashore. It's a terrible, terrible situation. It's full of hollow promises and governments that won't do anything about it. 
The crew needed visas and public health exemptions to get off the ship. The replacement crew would need to be flown in. As the ship arrived in Vancouver, Page was finally told he was going home. I feel so really I'm very uh, happy. One of Page's crewmates snapped a shot of him as he stepped onto dry land for the first time in 11 months. Uh, I'm just so happy, man. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even express. I want to have my children. I want to be with my family. I want to sleep with them. The shipping industry's been clobbered through the pandemic. Container shortages, that unprecedented surge in global demand, that ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. You know, you, you have uh, a little bit of a perfect storm with different things that are happening together. Experts say that's still no excuse to leave sailors stuck on ships for months on end with no way home. They say everyone, from governments to shipping companies to consumers, need to demand better and stand up for the people getting us all that stuff we want and need. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Explosive allegations that Iranian operatives plotted to kidnap prominent Canadians and Americans. I was shocked that the Islamic Republic was allowed to have such an operation in the American soil. Coming up, details of the alleged conspiracy to quiet Iran's critics. And what's supposed to be a pristine coastline is overwhelmed with garbage. Completely disheartening. This whole bay, this whole bay. One organization struggled to clean up the onslaught of plastic clogging up BC's shores. Plus. <laughs> Toronto plays center stage in a new Pixar movie, and that's not the only Canadian connection. Welcome back. Tokyo has reported its highest number of new COVID cases in almost six months, just over a week before the Olympics begin. And several arriving delegations are already experiencing outbreaks. There is a cluster of infections among staff at a hotel where dozens of Brazilian athletes are staying. Russia's Rugby Sevens team is isolating after their masseur tested positive. And a group of South African athletes is isolating because of a case on their flight. COVID cases are also rising in the UK, even as a major part of it gets ready to lift most restrictions. Lockdowns and vaccinations helped drive down cases earlier this year, but that was before the Delta variant. In recent weeks, the number of positive results has climbed steadily, hitting over 42,000 new cases today. Next Monday, England will lift the majority of its pandemic restrictions. But as Salima Shivji tells us, as cases rise, some experts worry the pandemic's not done with the country just yet. It's been billed by some as Freedom Day, when people across England are free to leave their masks behind, free to stop keeping their distance, free to start thinking the pandemic is behind them. Not so for Hal Cohen. He's had two kidney transplants and two jabs, but the medication he's on could mean the vaccine doesn't protect him from infection. A bit of a worrying time for me. Feels really uh, tough and definitely anxiety there on not knowing what risks you should take. His main worry and that of others who are immunocompromised is masks becoming a thing of the past. With coronavirus cases in the UK topping 40,000 today, numbers the country hasn't seen since mid-January, this time fueled by the more contagious Delta variant. Things like masks on public transport, maybe in shops, well, I don't really see them being an issue with people's freedom and then they protect other people like me. So I really would have liked the government to, to think of us in that respect. The government argues that vaccination is going well and more cases won't lead to as many hospitalizations. Still, this week, the prime minister shifted his tone somewhat. It is absolutely vital that we proceed now with caution. Emphasizing caution without changing his plan. Um, what the scientists are saying is this is the right date or is as good as any other date to do this. That's not the consensus. Many doctors and scientists call this move dangerous and irresponsible. So this is essentially herd immunity by infection for about half of our population. Why on earth we're exposing our young to those risks is very hard to understand or justify from any perspective, whether it's ethical or scientific. 
hard to justify for London's mayor too. He's keeping the mandatory mask order for public transit in the capital as the country experiments with how soon is too soon to lift restrictions. Salima Shivji, CBC News, London. Next on The National, there's a stretch of BC coastline that is hard to access, but people are still leaving a major impact. Having birds that dive in the ocean, they come up with this wrapped around their necks all the time. The challenge of cleaning up mountains of plastics washing ashore. Stay with us. Welcome back. Rescuers will try again this weekend to save a pair of right whales off the coast of New Brunswick's Acadian Peninsula. Both are entangled in thick ropes and fishing gear. The rescue team has tried three times to free one of the whales, a 16-year-old female. The population of North Atlantic right whales is dangerously low. Researchers estimate there are only about 350 left in the world. On another coast, fishing gear is a problem too. Discarded, tangled into huge masses, it ends up on BC's coastline along with other pieces of waste, including crumbling mountains of styrofoam. A massive effort is needed to clean all that up and millions of dollars. Greg Rasmussen caught up with the crews doing the heavy lifting. Twilight on the west coast of Vancouver Island, an idyllic vista that plays into Canada's image as a relatively untouched haven in a polluted world. But under the scenic veneer, a deeply troubling, dirty secret. Pretty well uh, everywhere we'd stop here, we'd be finding garbage. and. Uh really difficult place to clean up. Even getting the, uh, the garbage off is really a challenge. This is where the world's unending love affair with plastics crashes into the heartbreak of its impact on the environment. This remote beach rarely sees humans, but it does see a lot of plastic. The crew is sorting waste which has been driven ashore by wind and ocean currents. And there's a lot of it. This is good. Some of the debris can be traced. For instance, this hockey shin pad was likely from a cargo container that fell off a ship in the 1990s. It was one of the first documented containers built. Every step in the cleanup involves sweat and muscle. Debris is often entangled with wood or other natural objects. You can just cut through them pretty easy. This dock likely broke up somewhere on the west coast during a storm. Large styrofoam floats are the target of the cleanup crew. We can roll it over. Freeing the non biodegradable foam from the wooden planks is just step one. Okay. That's a good piece of foam. Once separated, the foam has to be carried hundreds of meters. Just off the beach, a vivid lesson on why styrofoam is enemy number one. This is an old dock that washed up in big pieces. So this stuff gets smashed apart by the logs. All of the winter storm action will just grind this down into small pieces. We're left with one little piece like that that can appear like food for some creatures. This ends up in a lot of birds. You can see already, just with this degradation, it's become part of the ground. With so much shoreline to clean, the little stuff usually gets left behind. Um, we're looking at trying to get the big stuff before it turns into the small stuff. Once sorted, it's stuffed into giant bags called super sacks. They line the beach, waiting for pickup by helicopter. Not exactly light. And this is what we have to walk over with all of this. BC's cleanup is covering 1,200 kilometers of coastline crews scrambling over jagged rocks and jumbles of slippery, wobbly logs. That probably weighs 200 pounds, just that alone. Often, uh, debris girls. is a tangled mess. Uh, plastic bags. Half buried and plastic too time consuming to extract. Downside. It would take us a month just to do this section alone to clear out all of the little stuff that's in here. A member of the Heshquiet First Nation, Jeff Ignis grew up on these beaches and has seen the plastic pile up over his lifetime. 
diving birds that dive in the ocean, they come up with this wrapped around their necks all the time. They try and eat it when they're diving and it gets tangled around them and then they drown. They can't fly, they can't swim, they can't eat. They starve and they die. We had one whale that came ashore that had this kind of green netting wrapped around three quarters of the animal. Plastic kills in a variety of ways. Nets and ropes entangle some creatures. Small pieces are mistaken for food and end up causing obstructions in the bellies of animals. And microplastics, the smallest particles, are in every ocean around the world and increasingly inside creatures up and down the food chain, including humans. Further north, another beach, another crew and days spent fighting through high seas, it's got a lot of heavy sand on it, I think. freeing trapped debris, and sorting and weighing every piece that's been found. On board one of the support vessels, skipper Kevin Smith says plastic dumping in the seas needs to be tackled at the source. It's quite sad to, to see just how much is coming from the, from the fishing industry. Deep sea fisheries, it's big trawl nets and uh, enormous heavy lines that um, are just choking out the beaches. Recently, he shot this video. One of the absolute worst sites for degraded microplastics that I've ever seen. He says it's island. devastating to see remote beaches where plastic yeah. particles are yeah. more numerous yeah. than yeah. sand. Where we were walking on a, a rainbow colored beach of plastics. And the microplastics is, you know, I, I think it's, it's the issue for, for our generation. But for now, the plastic onslaught continues. Check this out. This whole bank is basically foam. As far as you can stick your hand in, as far as you can dig in, completely, completely disheartening. This whole bank of this whole bay. In such a beautiful, pristine area. A fleet of vessels normally employed in the tourist trade is being used to support the cleanup, helping house and feed the workers. Here we've actually been able to make an industrial scale difference, and it's really exciting. Ross Campbell usually hosts foreign visitors aboard his boat. His business was hit hard by COVID-19, but he and other operators have shifted into cleanup work, paid by a $7 million plastic removal fund set up by the BC government. He wishes more people could see the scale of this largely hidden problem. There's two ways of looking at this. You know, I could either light our hair on fire because it's an insurmountable problem, or we can re realize that the very fact that we're doing this is, is letting the world know how bad the problem is and it can't be avoided any longer. From the beach, debris is slung out beneath a helicopter. It then travels the coast by barge. Finally, it's loaded into a truck and sent here. This new recycling center has been created to handle the unique needs of ocean plastics. With concern growing, many are calling for the plastic industry to do more. A lot of these materials are contaminated, so we've set this centre up to manage these materials specifically so that we can create specific products out of ocean plastics. The final product? Recycled pellets in need of a market. The effects of plastic pollution are really being felt on a global scale, um, and this is putting a lot of pressure on companies to do something about the plastics that they're using and selling for their products. Although the BC effort appears impressive, here's a sobering statistic. This year's entire cleanup project will likely gather about 400 tons of plastic. But over the course of this year alone, about 8 million tons will be added to the world's oceans. On the beach, a message to the world's plastic polluters. It is quite disturbing. Garbage cans are made for a reason. That's not supposed to be a garbage can. In the end, all this hard work is only a temporary solution. That's because as long as plastic waste is entering this ocean, it's gonna end up in places like this.
Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Estevan Point, BC. Coming up on The National, a coming of age story in a setting that's uniquely Canadian. Disney's love letter to Toronto and the groundbreaking diversity both on and off screen. But first. They told me that um, you're not safe here. An alleged conspiracy that sounds like it's straight out of a movie. U.S. prosecutors charge Iranian spies for plotting to kidnap critics on American soil. That's next. Welcome back. The U.S. has charged four Iranian intelligence operatives in an alleged plot to kidnap critics of Tehran. The targets included three Canadians and one person living in the U.K., but the most prominent target, an Iranian-American journalist. Chris Reyes spoke to the woman at the center of the plan. Iranian-American journalist Masi Alinejad posted this on Twitter, showing police protection outside her New York home. Alinejad says she is one of the intended victims of a kidnap plot that U.S. prosecutors say was planned by Iranian intelligence officers. Details came out in an unsealed indictment. It was eight months ago when the FBI actually came to my house in Brooklyn and they told me that um, you're not safe here. Federal prosecutors allege Iran used private investigators to track her every move, even researching military-style speedboats and routes of evacuation from Manhattan to Venezuela. I was shocked that the Islamic Republic was allowed to have such an operation in the American soil. Four men from Iran now face several conspiracy charges related to kidnapping, bank fraud and money laundering. Another person living in California, also from Iran, was arrested earlier this month. One of the women who put the headscarf on a stick and waved it like that. You know what happened to her? She got disappeared. Alina Jad has earned millions of followers in the scorn of Tehran for her advocacy. She says she's used to being threatened, but this was on another level. I'm not a criminal. I'm a journalist. This Toronto-based lawyer says he's been threatened for criticizing Iran. U.S. prosecutors say the kidnap plot also targeted three Canadians. He wants more protections in this country. That I want our leaders to start thinking of us hyphenated Canadians or Americans as full citizens and, um, you know, treat these threats to our lives um, as they would threats to any other Canadian or American. Alina Jad says she won't be silenced. If I keep silent, it means I'm going to betray all of these people within the society. Both the White House and Global Affairs Canada have condemned the alleged plot. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Next on The National, a Regina artist blew up on TikTok. Now he's teaming up with a music superstar. Tesher and Derulo, it's a worldwide party. Tesher tells us how he feels about his sweet success. Plus. Another Toronto artist shapeshifts into social media stardom. Stay with us. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as Republicans push voting laws widely seen as suppression, Texas becomes the next battleground. A look at what, if anything, Joe Biden will do to fight back. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Disney's Pixar Studios is causing a stir this side of the border as the animation giant's newest movie is completely set in Toronto. But as Eli Glasner shows us, the film's location is only part of what has so many Canadians excited. No, no, this isn't happening. For a film about a girl who transforms into a giant red panda, turning red might look familiar for Torontonians. The upcoming Pixar film is littered with maple leaves and Canadian Easter eggs. Yes! The Lester B. Pearson School, Toronto's Chinatown, and hey look, the CN Tower. I went through a couple of different emotions. But what caught this Toronto filmmaker's attention was the sense of diversity. It wasn't just like a couple of racialized people peppered in. It was front and center. My child goes to this Already within, literally within 10 seconds, we had seen things in animation that I'd never seen before. 
Perhaps the most Canadian element is the woman behind it, Toronto's Domi Chi. And the Oscar goes to Bao. Who won an Oscar for her story about a Chinese soup dumpling that comes to life. Because I really wanted to see um, just my culture and like the, the, these types of food that I grew up with and these people that I, that I was surrounded by growing up, like on the big screen. I've been a Domi Shi fan, you know, since she released Bao. This um, animator isn't surprised Pixar is giving Shi a big platform. You bring those experiences into your stories and into your artwork and Obviously, that adds so much more value, but it also adds a perspective that we don't often get to see on the big screen. Another thing we don't usually see is Toronto playing itself. This movie feels like it's a love letter to Toronto, to Canada. <laughs> this animation fan says it follows Pixar's trend of embracing locations, whether it's Italy, New York City, and now... This is Canada's time, and they're showing the world through Domichi's eyes, right? Yeah. That this is Toronto, this is who we are, this is the people we have here. Oh, get a hug. Pixar promises a closer look when Turning Red opens next year. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Pretty cool. After going viral last year, a Regina musician is once again making headlines. And this time he's got some serious star power right by his side. I'm a dog killer kitty, no apology. <laughs> He goes by Tesher, a 25-year-old South Asian Canadian rapper who's been piling up the views on social media. Baby, let me see it. But it wasn't until his most recent song that he caught the attention of an R&B superstar. He said it, uh, it was something really new, something that he hadn't really heard before, and we ended up collaborating on the record via Zoom, me in my basement in Regina, Saskatchewan, and him in his... Uh, in his uh, home studio in Los Angeles. That collaboration is now approaching nearly 200 million streams, and the music video, which was released yesterday, has already racked up more than 2 million views. Our next guest's newest single is setting the summer on fire. And a spot on NBC's The Today Show. But even with the newfound fame, Tesher is still savoring his time at home. I love the fact that I'm, st I'm like in this part of my career music video with Jason Derulo, top 40 record, but I'm here in, in Regina in my basement and my mom is like giving me like breakfast before she leaves for work. Maybe not for much longer if his star keeps rising. Next, it's not exactly magic, but it sure looks like it. I just have such a passion for making these videos that I just can't stop. How this Toronto animator is making some pretty magical videos and has millions of people watching. Our moment is next. Toronto's Kevin Perry has become a bit of an online superstar for magical edits like this. 344 individual pictures turned into an epic stop motion video. The Toronto animator has millions of people watching his videos, captivated by the illusions he creates. Tonight, he's our moment. I have a background in animation. Constantly figuring out what works, what doesn't. Just the patience to do it one picture at a time. Uh, just create a fun video. You kind of just learn how to break down motion 1 24th of a second at a time. I just have such a passion for making these videos that I just can't stop. The running thread throughout all of it is, am I crazy enough to make this video? Can I put a camera on the ceiling and make it look like there's gravity, you know, going sideways along the floor? The ones turning into things, are, they're very quick to make. It's more of the setup and like, figuring out how it's going to be staged, the choreography, lining up the objects. Um, so it's kind of like a few weeks of just like thinking about making it work and then the actual doing it is like the small 10% at the end. I just try to make the coolest stuff possible and the audience luckily just kind of comes to it. Perry says he's not into this for the fame. He has one million followers and counting, by the way, but he just cares about making good videos. And he has a two-month-old baby at home. Took a short break, but he's back at it, which is pretty remarkable. He can find the time and 
He feels lucky for that. That's the National for July 14th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Good night.